G'day, I'm Jason Edwards. Welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. And I'm Maddie Claire Sloan. This week we visit a unique photographer who creates fantasy artwork by combining her photographs and digital art. Yeah, Jace, this is hers here. It's pretty amazing, huh? It's incredible. Also on the show, I catch up with Scott Mellish from Panasonic to help me find the right camera. Trust me, there is a few. All this and more coming up on Snap Happy, the photography show. There are many styles of photography, from documentary realism to stylized illustrative. Take one step further and you get story art. Enter the world of fantasy, where your imagination can run wild and your dreams can come true. Karen Alsop is the award-winning photographer who has developed this unique style of portraiture by combining photography with digital art. Story art is uh, a recent passion of mine that's really taken off. Uh, it's all about creating images that aren't real. Uh, it's about bringing children into their imagination, bringing them to life. And you've been a photographer for a long time now. What was the impetus to, to shift tack in your career? Weddings and portraits, as much as I enjoy them, uh, weddings with young children, which we have now, are a challenge. Uh, long days and finding babysitters and all of that. So I started looking for something that could work in with my family life a little bit more. Uh, and it actually just came about starting to create images for local businesses uh, and finding that I had a skill in that area uh, in photoshopping and, and creating them and it's just skyrocketed since then. So. so take me through the process, what goes into creating a story art image? Okay, I come up with an idea, a bit of a concept to start off with and I picture it in my mind and I, I usually have a really clear idea. So then I start working out, okay, what do I need to shoot for the background, what do I need to shoot uh, for the different elements that I need. So with the Cinderella piece, I needed a, a goose, I needed mice for the ears, I needed horses galloping away, I need a pumpkin and a carriage. And so all of those elements I've needed to capture separately with the right lighting, the right perspective, the right lenses so that I can bring it together as one piece. So Karen, after you've captured all of the individual frames, how do you go about putting them together? I use Photoshop uh, and it's a really powerful tool uh, but what I actually do is I, I need to sift through all the images, I need to pick the one that's going to fit the best so I start with the background scene uh, and I, I start with that and edit that and then I bring in my other elements and just one by one I layer them in in Photoshop. I use a Wacom graphics tablet so that I can accurately draw and cut out. Uh, we've got the green screen here and I use this quite often when I'm shooting my models because it means that I can quickly uh, cut them out of the scene and bring them into the, the final scene. And then once I've sort of got everything together, it's, it's a lot of refining, it's a lot of sort of light painting and uh, bringing shadows and highlights in where I need and sometimes some little magical particles and things like that. So uh, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into it, there's hours of work that goes into it. And this latest piece is made up of so many different components, but you know, I need a challenge, I need to not do the same thing over and over again. So, no, that's yeah. good. At the City Edge Centre in Melbourne, we find one of Karen's commission works on display. Tell me about the, the image itself. Basically, I created it to go with the verse here, uh, specifically for this centre. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit in each season. Their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do. And in my mind, I wanted to capture that life. I wanted to capture, uh, you know, a, a sense of uh, imagination and excitement. And this girl is just kind of contemplating and looking up and maybe even seeking wisdom from up here so I wanted it to be something that people look at and kind of take their own ideas from. Yeah, yeah. interpret it differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you ever create, completely artificially create elements or it's all done through photographs? I wish I was that talented. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and if you could see me draw, I can't draw at oh, all. No. Stick figures is about <laughs> it. So. You never know what you might find on a nature walk. It's fantastic to find things like snake skins. They're incredibly fragile and amazingly beautiful at the same time. What I often look for when I'm shooting something like this is just the patterns and the textures. So I'm using a macro lens, a close-up lens, and a set of close-up flashes just to increase the amount of light I can get onto the scales as I get closer and closer to the skin. Keep in mind that the closer you are to an object, the less depth of field you're going to have, the less will be in focus. 
So use a larger aperture number, f16, 18, 22, whatever you can manage. When I was at Cradle Mountain, Ranger Kate Burton suggested I visit Mount Field National Park and the spectacular Russell Falls. Well, I've just arrived and it looks like a great day for some low light photography. Russell Falls is a short 10 minute walk from Mount Field Visitor Centre. The sound of rushing water grows louder as you approach the lookout. I have to admit, it's far more spectacular than I expected. The great thing is, is that the rain and the weather that's been hammering us on this assignment has actually been flowing down the rivers and has now created this, which will be fantastic for photography. When I get to a scene like this, I spend a few moments dissecting it, thinking about what elements I want to translate in my imagery. The full cascade of the falls, the plants growing behind, the water smashing into the rock, even the curtain of water flowing down beneath my feet. So take a few minutes and think about what really matters the most to you. When photographing waterfalls, I always start with a fast shutter speed, and that freezes the water. That gives a sense of strength and power. And then I change to a slow shutter speed, and that allows more water to pass through the frame before the exposure is finished. All cameras are pretty much the same. They want to expose your pictures for what's known as neutral grey. It's pretty much the difference between black and white. If I take a photo with my camera automatically setting the exposure, the picture's going to be a little bit light. That's because the scene is dark and the camera wants to make it grey. What I do to overcome this is I've got an exposure compensation button. You've probably got one too. It's a little plus and minus button. And what I do is I dial that down towards the minus side and that takes some of the light out of the picture to compensate for the camera being fooled by the scene and the scene is automatically far more accurate than it was before. It's a really simple trick that doesn't manipulate the image in any way, but it compensates for the camera being pulled by the ambient light. You'd be surprised how easy it is to actually miss the moment when you're a photographer. So step back once you've taken the photos you want and enjoy it. Enjoy the beauty and the wonder of what you've just captured. It'll make all the difference to the experience. With the increased popularity of social media, such as Facebook and Instagram, we have seen a new breed of photographer emerge. Chris Nobbs has over 36,000 followers on Instagram. Tell me about your photography. Where did you begin and how did you wind up where you are now? I bought myself a little um, digital camera. Mm -hmm. And um, from there it started just taking nature pictures. I really love to take pictures with, um, of animals. Um, just and architectures and um, from that point basically Instagram I found a person who had like toy pictures which inspired me to do my own as well he had them pose and then make jokes with them so that inspired me thinking if a person comes on Instagram wants to swipe through the pictures why don't they want to smile um, at some of the pictures? So making people sort of feel good about the imagery that they were looking at. Yeah, that's right. Now you've got you know, tens of thousands of followers. Yeah. How, how did that happen? How did you get such a huge following, do you think? Well, I got actually lucky um, that I happened to be on the popular page a couple of times. Wow. Because okay. the popular page that opens the image to everyone in the world basically yes. um, at that stage when it was on so most of them just followed me from there yeah. and after that's just hard work basically being creative because um, when you look through my pictures um, the older stages were all toy photography people think I just stand them take a picture takes just a few seconds yeah. but in reality um, to get the right angle to post them real life like yeah. get the idea um, and everything. Um, one time I worked on one pose for one hour. Yeah. So you're giving it a fair amount of thought before you're actually doing your image capture. Yeah, yeah. Now this sun's getting low on the horizon. Yeah. Do you want to uh, set us up something here? Show us, show yeah, us a I bit might of do magic? That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. There you go. I'll take that because otherwise I'll keep him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The 
so many digital cameras in the market these days, it's hard to pick just one. So I'm here with Scott Mellish from Panasonic to help us work out which one I should choose. Thanks for having me here. No problems at all. Now, you're trying to help me pick and work out the difference between these. Why are there so many? Well, there's a number of different cameras, of course, in different shapes and sizes and features and that type of thing. And that's because everyone has different styles of photography yep. and they're looking to get something different out yep. of their photography. So if I'm trying to pick a camera that is a point and shoot, really easy to use, and I don't really know much about photography just yet, which one would I pick? Probably you'd look at something like the TZ70 over yep. here. So this model here is designed to be, like you said, nice and small, yep. easy to put in your pocket and that type of thing. Um, this is actually designed as a travel style camera. So basically it's got a nice big lens range, so it's wide angle and you can zoom in and get the nice details of things in the distance, but it's nice and pocketable. It's point and shoot. It's simple to use yep. and the image quality is great. But if you step up to something like this one here, the difference is that this model here packs a much bigger lens range okay. in, in the one body. So yes, it's a bigger body, but the beauty here is that you can zoom in a lot further to the subject that you're trying to photograph. Yep. You also get things like the um, articulated screen here, you get a viewfinder as well, you yep. get yeah, touch screen and all, all those type of things. And then from there, you go into the interchangeable lens range. So all of these cameras in this area are interchangeable lens. You can take the lenses off and you can actually mix and match them with, with each other. With any camera. So all of these, so this camera's lenses okay. will actually change with this camera's lenses as well. So um, which one you fit into within this range obviously comes down to your specific needs. Yeah. So Scott, what sets the Panasonic range apart from others? One of the things that Panasonic's leading the charge with is a progression to 4K technology. So uh, you might have heard of this, but basically 4K is the next standard in video technology. If you're a stills shooter, not a video shooter, there are still some benefits that 4K can have for you. So because you can shoot video on uh, in 4K on a lot of these models, yep. that's essentially capable of shooting that video at 30 shots or 30 frames per yep. second. Your normal burst speeds on cameras tend to be around the five, anywhere from five to 10 frames per second. Yep. But utilizing this 4K technology, you can actually get that 30 frames per second. So you're able to capture moments that a normal burst mode would miss, which is something that's really, really exciting. Yeah. And, and then the other little uh, add-on to that is a feature called 4K pre-burst. Okay. So what happens with this camera, I can wait for the moment to happen and I can actually miss the moment, but the camera enables me to go back in time, 30 frames, and get the shot that I actually missed. It's like time travel. Technology. <laughs> in, in, uh, in, the, in a camera. So yeah. that type of stuff is really exciting. It's just something that it's, it's a new thing in photography. It is literally changing the way people think yep. about taking shots. It's a new tool in the arsenal. And having that 4K video technology come in has lots of benefits for stills photographers as well. So Very the Wi-Fi on these as well. So I found when I was yeah. traveling, I could quickly just pop them to the phone. Absolutely. <laughs> well, look, that's one for me, especially for travel. Yeah. I think that's one of the best things about these because you can be out there, you can meet someone and take their photo, yep. and then you can Wi Fi that to Straight your away. phone and yep. send it to them or email it to them, uh, that type of thing. And the other benefit, of course, is that if you have one of these cameras set somewhere, you can actually remote control it. So you can yep. walk around, get in the shot. Awesome. You don't have to like press the timer and run. You've got the phone right there, there and you can see exactly what the camera sees and of course you can control everything about the camera there as well. It's yeah. crazy. Crazy. Well, let's get shooting shall we? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Thanks so much Scott. Thank you. of story art. I create digital photographic art mainly featuring children and animals and I capture lots of different images and bring them together to create one finished piece. My name is Karen Alsop and this is what's in my kit. I've got a, primarily my Canon 5D Mark III uh, and often you'll find on the end of that I've got my 24 to 70 Canon lens, 2.8 aperture and this is my go-to lens, this is the one that I use the most. I also have a Tamron 70 to 200. I have used this in some of my recent story art pieces too just to get closer to geese and mice and things so this is a good lens to have in my kit. This lens I don't use all that often but it's my 100mm macro lens. Uh, it's a Canon and obviously being a macro I can get nice and close to very small objects. 
This is my wide angle lens. Uh, it's my 16 to 35 Canon. Recently with one of my images, the Cinderella piece that I'm creating, I was in the city, I didn't have a lot of playroom and I needed to capture one of those carriages that sit on the side of the road. And I was in between a bus stop and the carriage. So I was able to get in nice and close, still get the whole of the carriage in my shot. So this lens is fantastic. This is another favourite lens, it's another Sigma. It's my 50mm uh, 1.4. And this lens is beautiful for portraits. It creates beautiful blurred out backgrounds as well. Again, another Sigma. This one has a very good reputation. It's the 35mm uh, Sigma Art uh, 1.4. And it is an amazing lens. If you haven't checked it out, it is well worth checking it out. Now also in my kit, I'm often photographing children, so I need some little tricks to help them uh, smile and be happy. So I've got this little device and it sits on my hot shoe. And when I'm finding I need to entertain the kids, I can just press the little tummy on here and create some little sounds and things like that. But that's a very handy little thing to have in your kit. My name is Karen Alsop and that's what's in my kit. Many people ask me about my workflow. After I have taken an image in the field, there is a process to turn my shot into a fine art print. I have met up with Jeremy Dalda from Image Science to discuss this process. Image Science began in about uh, 2002 when I got back from living in the UK and uh, was a little frustrated with the quality of photographic services, in particular scanning in this country. So uh, I found that quite frustrating and saw a hole in the market and uh, bought myself a very nice scanning machine. Um, that led quickly into printing uh, and from there um, basically the entire area of post-click photographic production. Take me through what goes into doing a fine art print. Well it depends a lot on what, what you're starting with really. Um, uh, you know, uh, with someone like yourself often we're starting with really good files that are in, um, in really good shape and you know how to do a lot of that post-production work and um, you have an excellent assistant in Katie who um, uh, helps you get the file ready. So very often in the case of someone like yourself it's simply take the file lay it out as a document, um, do any final checks and so on, uh, possibly give advice on things like sharpening and a little bit of colour balance and so forth. Um, and then take it to print, make the actual print. Um, and uh, depending on whether you already know what stock you want, we can have a conversation about, you know, fine art stocks. So Jeremy, we've, we've got the print, it's come out and it's dried. It's a real process, isn't it? The art of the fine art print is not a quick art, um, but you know, it is, it is an artwork now in its own right and it's a very beautiful thing if you've got everything right. Um, so at this stage we normally do a print inspection which is basically where we look very closely for any flaws in the paper or the print process that might have happened. We're happy with the print at this point and it's really just a question of finishing it off uh, which is you know signing it and adding uh, uh, what's called a chop mark um, which is uh, an embossed embellishment on a print and you have your um, symbol, I forget what actually West African potto. Of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> the West African potto. Um, it's a delightful little symbol and, uh, and we impress it upon your print and it's just another way of saying this is an authentic Jason Edwards uh, output. So now you've seen the process from me capturing the image in the field, processing it in my office and bringing it here to Image Science, which as always, fantastic. Here I have two cameras that I quite often use when I don't have my big 5D Mark III on me. The iPhone is really a fantastic camera to obviously get those everyday shots. Uh, I am always taking shots of my kids on this and uploading them to an online gallery so that I don't lose them. This camera here I really love because I can put it in my bag, it's the Sony A6000. Uh, it's 24 megapixels, uh, I can get better shots than I can with the iPhone. Every year I create a book for my kids. Uh, uh, that celebrates their life and has all different photos in it uh, that tells the story of their life over the year. Um, and I do that with iPhone photos, I do it with A6000 photos, I do it with 5D Mark III photos, whatever it is, it all goes in and it's celebrating their life. And I think it's really important that you don't print your photos, don't leave them on a hard drive because in 10 years time, you won't have them anymore. So this is my tip for you guys. <laughs> So what did you think of Karen's work? Oh, it's amazing. She has some crazy Photoshop skills, doesn't she? She does. Now, where are you taking us next week? Next week, I'll be travelling the Victorian shipwreck coast, where I'll give some tips on shooting the coastline from the air. I'll have a treetop adventure, and I'll catch up with surf photographer legend, Barry Sutherland. What about you? Well, I get some tips about how to take a flattering portrait on the smartphone. 
But don't forget to sign up to our mailing list at snaphappytv.com for exclusive content, competitions and offers from our partners. We'll see you next week on Snap Happy, the photography show.